episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Walton. What's up, SCS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. It just occurred to me that uh, the start of every UFC uh, main event, Bruce Buffer, the Octagon announcer, always goes, we are live. And uh, it was a horrible imitation, but thinking uh, if any out there knows bruce buffer i would love him for my uh the new open to the show that we are working on um wow how amazing would that be i thought i wanted keith morrison but now it is uh bruce buffer the octagon announcer for the ufc so you never know maybe he's watching the show but um i was telling our esteemed guests the last couple of days very very heavy shows most shows in true crime are but today try to have a little bit more fun um this, however, once again, is a twisted tale of a mother of three who uh, allegedly murdered her husband. She's been sitting in jail for uh, upwards of a year here, uh, profiting from a children's book about grief. Uh, it was kind of crazy. She wrote a book about grief uh, and went on local TV in Salt Lake City. Uh, and then we come to find out she's now accused of the uh, person of uh, murdering the person she was grieving over, who was her husband. Uh, this, of course, is Utah mom, Corey Richens. Um, she, according to authorities, spiked her husband Eric's Moscow Mule cocktail. They were celebrating a real estate deal, uh, gave him five times the lethal dose of fentanyl. We haven't talked about this case in a long time. And now there is a crazy, crazy plot twist. We are finding out that Corey's mother, um, who was with a woman uh, back in 2006, that woman died and uh, police for upwards of a year have been investigating that death, which was uh, ruled an o accidental overdose. They're now looking at that death as a suspicious death, and it could be potentially a homicide. Uh, let me introduce the guests. I almost forgot where I was here. Greg Scordis is supposed to join us. Um, he is an attorney uh, in Salt Lake City who's been practicing since 1982. He's also uh, a spokesperson for Eric Richens' family, the husband's family. Uh, he did warn me he's got court today and he might be running late, but he should be hopping on at some point. Megan Connor is back by popular demand. I know you are all excited about this. I can't even remember. She was on the show. It was either last week or the week before. She is the mother of six spectacular human beings and a breaker of generational trauma cycles. She survived sex trafficking as a child and spent almost 40 years in other abusive systems before finally learning how to break free. She's now an author. Um, I Walk Through the Fire to Get Here is one of her books and 100 Ways to Practice Self-Care. And uh, she was very vocal when she was on here. Uh, of course, she's Lori Vallow's cousin as well, but that's almost a, a footnote to her story. And um, she did tell us when she was on last time uh, that she uh, had left the Church of Latter-day Saints. Um, and so she brings some interesting perspective uh, tonight. Now, for more than 25 years, Chris Thomas, who's been a guest on our show uh, several times, uh, he's worked with clients ra uh, ranging from Fortune 500 companies to professional sports teams. Uh, he managed more than 300 uh, issues and crises and contributed uh, to several books before writing his own. Uh, it is a book about uh, Elizabeth Smart, who he was in, uh, involved with in terms of helping her with the PR aspect of things uh, after her uh, kidnapping and during the kidnapping, I should say, and rescue. The book is called Unexpected. If you haven't checked it out, great book, Unexpected by Chris Thomas. Uh, the first and most obvious question I mean, Chris, you're a storyteller. Uh, we had Chris on recently because his firm had represented Shanna Gardner in some capacity prior prior to that whole story blowing up. But Chris, um, truth is 1,000% stranger than fiction. I mean, did you ever see this coming with this story? Now the mother possibly being investigated. No, and I think it's really interesting because she's been in the media so much that we kind of feel like we know her. And so... To see that, I was watching 
uh, a, a couple of media interviews earlier today and, and just to see where she was coming from uh, and now hearing, and again, these are allegations, Let, let's be really clear. Uh, we don't know mm -hmm. that th these are fact, but the fact that she's being looked at for this, yeah, you couldn't have written something stranger on that. Let me just clarify something though quickly regarding Shanna Gardner. Uh, I, I worked a volunteer capacity with a, a, a consortium of, of, of other PR professionals who provide pro bono services to families in crisis called familyspokesperson.org in, in uh, helping her uh, surrounding her children uh, shortly after the murder. So anyway, just, just to provide that context. No, I'm, I'm glad you did. Um, it was uh, from a long distance uh, and for a short time. Um, but uh, we will eventually get back to that Shanna Gardner story, which is another crazy story. Um, Megan, to you, um, Corey Richens, uh, she's arrested last year. She's got serious charges, which is why we had uh, Greg Scordis coming on, and I'm sure he will hop in at some point. He's uh, just so well-versed in the law, but she's been charged with aggravated murder and three counts of possession of a controlled substance, uh, which is that fentanyl, with intent to distribute. Um, when you heard this, uh, what what ran through your mind? Um, I think this came at a time when there was kind of a rash of these different, um, you know, family situations cropping up where family members were harming other family members. And to me, it just felt super overwhelming um, to kind of have this list of, of all these people that were doing harm to their own families. And of course, it resonated with me um, deeply on a, on a disturbing level. And so it's hard to take a look at these things and and kind of dig down and ask ourselves what's going on here with these relationships and and why are people so um, reluctant to, you know, come out and talk about their family problems with each other rather than you know resorting to, I guess I would consider poisoning sort of a passive aggressive action against a family member, uh, with a very direct result. Uh, and sadly for uh, Eric Richens, it was uh, the end for him. Um, Lindsey Hendricks, I love Chris Thomas's old school desk in the back there. Um, it is a cool desk. I want to flip up that little uh, accordion panel. Um, but Chris, I mean, speaking to what Meg, uh, Megan, I always say Megan, what Megan is is talking of, um, what, what do you think, I mean, you're a guy that's involved in, you know, optics, PR, but it seems, it appears like there's a major problem nationally with this whole family dynamic i mean i was just watching a story uh yesterday a horrific story um that i i think i'll have trouble covering that one although people want us to where this dad uh basically executed his three young sons who are like the all-american looking boys um and now they've thrown out his confession and it's getting complicated and yada 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 but much more broadly speaking i don't know in the work that you do have you seen any kind of break or or fissure in the family dynamic um generally speaking until first and foremost families are complicated your family my family we're all complicated it's when it rises to a certain level uh and, and i think we're seeing more of this obviously the you know, mental health is an epidemic in our country uh and and i think we're becoming tighter wound covid probably played some into that uh and the way in which people are are responding to the stresses of life uh, can be very detrimental. Uh, going to Megan, you know, having the self care, 100, 100 ways of self care, incredibly important uh, to find those avenues. But not everybody has has the help that that uh, some can afford, others can't or can't get. Uh, and and I think that that contributes to it. That's not the only cause, but that's something that definitely uh, contributes to some of the issues we're seeing. And uh, I'm going to go through this and kind of break down these latest developments. Um, piecemeal, but I just want to get some of these generalizations out there. Um, Corey's mother, her name is Lisa Darden. And again, she is now being investigated for a suspicious death of her lover, uh, a woman um, whose name is Trudy Moore, Gertrude Trudy Moore. So um, just a really bizarre uh, twist in all this. And again, I will kind of deconstruct it piece by piece for everybody. But uh, this book is about writing and uh, both of these guests are authors. But uh, Megan has a book out, um, you know, about going through the fire and still being here. But Zoe B has a, kind of an interesting question. Do we think Corey's writing a book about being locked up uh, 
is waiting for trial now. Uh, will she write another book about being an incarcerated mom if she's convicted? Was she planning on a trilogy? Um, I, I know some of this is obviously said in jest, but uh, Megan, you wrote your book. It was kind of a cathartic experience. <laughs> Um, do you think, what do you think was behind her? It was so bizarre that she wrote this children's book. Do you think it was in some odd, bizarre way, um, therapeutic for her? And before you answer that real quick, look at this McLean, Virginia, you guys are the best met Joel at crime con just so everyone knows. Um, we have not officially been invited to crime con yet. Um, although we obviously, uh, requested to be, so we're still waiting. Um, and they're, you know, figuring out the last minute um, details of who else will be allowed. But uh, the COE and I are talking, even if we're not officially on podcast row, uh, I believe we will be there in some capacity. So I just wanted to let you guys know that everyone welcoming back Megan and Chris here. Um, but what about that point? Do you think that writing this book was therapeutic for her in some way? Well, what I found interesting about it is that the interview where she goes on to the show and she talks about writing the book, she says, you know, my kids and I kind of wrote this together, but in reality, she used a ghostwriter for that. Mm -hmm. And so when you use a ghostwriter, generally speaking, you have an outline or you have some ideas that you put out there and then a ghostwriter kind of fills in the blank. So I don't think it was therapeutic for either her or her children. If they, if they used a ghostwriter, it, it was their ideas, but not necessarily their words. So I'm kind of confused about how she put that together. That's a great point about uh, having a ghostwriter. I totally forgot about that. Wildfire letting us know the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. But to Chris's point, these are all allegations right now. I want to be very clear, but police have formally said that they are investigating her. Um, we have no lawyers and no s official psychologists. So uh, it'll be more fun that way because we can uh, just take, uh, you know, our own, uh, give our own takes about this, but Jenny price, who's uh, always in the chat with good questions. Uh, she says, people who poison are wild. Um, how do you know it's going to work? How are they not going to detect it? Why would that be the choice? Google search, kidney, liver slides, hair, nails, just so many ways to get caught. Uh, Chris, I'm just wondering. Uh, and by the way, before you, we get to that from Kirsten, I'm actually not really surprised a mom would do this. If, we, if she was willing to do that to her husband, I thought my ex's dad could have been involved in my case. So uh, maybe a little more common than we know. But Chris, what do you make of this poisoning, um, this poison killing, as opposed to, you know, we, we've covered them all, uh, hiring a hitman, suffocating, strangulation, et cetera, et cetera. What do you make of the fact that she poisoned him? I think it's always a head scratcher. Again, you know, this is alleged at the same time. It's interesting in true crime when we see this. I think we're all asking the question of what were they thinking? How how would you even start to get away with it? And I'm my wife and I are always saying, isn't there a better way? Wouldn't it have just been better to have gotten divorced or to moved on or, or something like that? In the long run, wouldn't that have been so much easier? Because it, it would seem like it would take such an elaborate scheme to either poison someone or to take them out in some other way. And to do that successfully, and even if you did it successfully, maybe I have too much of a conscience, uh, I would have trouble living with that. I think that that would be something that, that's very heavy. At the same time, I think most of us who are true crime fans never would even imagine doing the things we read and, and, and hear about. A hundred percent. And that's because you're a, a nice, rational human being, and that's why you wouldn't do it. Um, it always like it boggles my mind and the psychological aspect of all this true crime is what really intrigues me. It's what got me into it. And, uh, you know, long before I had this show, I was watching every single dateline, every single 2020. Um, and so was, so was Carm. And speaking of Carm, uh, from sweet and salty, I'm missing you and Carm on court TV last night. It was supposed to be tonight actually, but, um, Vinnie Politan has other plans. He wanted investigators that happens all the time. So, uh, they're going to have us on probably uh, tomorrow or Friday, actually, and I'll let you know. But uh, they are covering uh, the Maddie Soto case. And, of course, that is the horrific story out of Orlando, not far from where I am from, um, just 13 years old. And it uh, turns out she uh, is suspected to be uh, have been murdered by her mother's boyfriend. So uh, that case is one we are following closely. From Astra, uh, Megan, truly a best guest and inspiration. So getting into some of the details about this, 
Um, and, and I can't overstate how, I don't know, blown away I am by the fact that I, I discovered that there's this new facet to this story uh, just recently. I, and I just did a double take. But investigators, Megan, they say that they learned that the uh, mother's partner, uh, again, the partner's name was Gertrude Trudy Moore, uh, that she also overdosed. And it happened 16 years before Eric Richens, uh, the husband of Corey Richens. The fact that both of these people, the mother and the daughter, um, both their significant others, in the case of Corey, her husband, in the case of the mother, her partner, does that does that give you more reason to believe that uh, Corey and or her mother uh, very likely are, in fact, guilty of this? Well, I don't want to speculate on guilt or innocence, but it just certainly is um, you know, it's it's bizarre to see this happen within this family, right? And it makes you wonder if mom passed on some perhaps harmful traits to her daughter, if there was maybe some communication about, you know, how to deal with difficult relationships or the money aspect is always a huge part of it. You know, I think didn't the mom um, inherit the state of her partner and then Corey also financially benefited from the death of her husband. And so, you know, it's my understanding. And, and I, I'll have to give a lot of credit to Hidden True Crime. I love Dr. John Mathias. He's really good at analyzing these people. Um, his comments about poisoning murders are that people who poison are deeply insecure. They feel like they're, they're very immature because they feel like they're not getting their own way. And this is maybe a means to get that. I found that pretty fascinating. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how this unfolds to see whether there was a connection between the mom and the daughter, whether there was some information sharing there. And, and maybe that's why. Hmm. Uh, there was, I'm seeing comments in the chat. There was insurance uh, payout. There were insurance payouts uh, involved in both cases. I'm going to get to that in just a moment, but you always have to follow the money. Uh, KO Las Vegas, by the way, this is uh, the victim of Corey Richens, her husband. Uh, obviously, a very um, nice looking guy, uh, father of three young children. Greg Scordis, who's on here, always talks about what a great daddy uh, was and how he always put his kids uh, first. And now, of course, he's no longer with us, which is just hard to believe. And that wasn't the first time, allegedly, that she tried to uh, poison him. A lot of people said, hey, why didn't he get out of there? Well, it's, you know, I think it's tough for anybody to imagine that your spouse is going to sit there and try to kill you. So um, that's likely why he stuck around. But um, KO Las Vegas, what is horribly wrong with some people? Is a, is a divorce not the best option? Chris uh, Thomas, uh, your take on that comment. I mean, a rational person, me, you, Megan, uh, most people in STS. Uh, they get a divorce. Why is it, do you think, that some people just do not apply rationale or don't think of this, the consequences? I think that's part of the reason that true crime is so interesting, is trying to analyze and figure that out. Like, why, why wouldn't they just do that? Why wouldn't they just get a divorce or step away or whatever the situation might be that would be a significantly better alternative than doing something really stupid. But psychologically, there has to be something going on, like Megan was referring to with poisoning and how that, you know, that some of those uh, underlying mental health issues, how they manifest themselves uh, differently with, with the things they do, the ways in which they're trying to manipulate or control the situation. Uh, it, to the reasonable and rational people, it just doesn't make sense as to why you, you wouldn't do something uh, less evasive, intrusive, you know, with, with serious consequences. Uh, why, you know, and, and I think a lot of times they don't think about it. I don't think they think about how that's going to impact their children, their family. Uh, there are so many victims in the wake of a crime like this. Hmm. Uh, by the way, someone is asking me to cover the Caleb Harris disappearance. And uh, it's funny you say that because uh, it's the time of the week where I'm bugging the COE that we've got to prep next week. And I'm literally writing that. I'm not ignoring anyone. I am putting down a note because I wanted to cover that story. And I think we will uh, next week. That's a good thing about hosting your own show is that you can decide. I no longer have to be told what to do every day by Fox News or anyone else. Uh, Beach Life, please. Megan and COE need to need to do a daytime show. Um, 
the notorious COE and Megan, innocent Megan and the notorious COE. I like it. So uh, we will get them together as long as Megan is willing to come on. The COE is now hosting uh, what someone described as a the view like show, uh, the view like version of uh, STS during the week. So I will get them in touch. Uh, it was actually, I think, the COE who put me in touch with Megan. So uh, we will make that uh, we will make that happen. Uh, Megan, I don't have to tell you, you've experienced this firsthand in the most traumatic of ways where your cousin Lori didn't opt for a divorce um, and did the most heinous thing possible. Why? And more broadly, what is it about these people who go to these extreme measures and number one are selfish, but number two, don't even think about the consequences of, you know, where look at her life now. It's a disaster. Yeah, I think in Lori's case, there was uh, a healthy dose of, um, I don't know, she, I, I think she believed she wasn't ever going to get caught. You know, I think she really believed that that she was going to get away with it and and that, she, you know, she and Alex um, certainly getting away with Charles's murder. And, and again, allegedly, because she's on trial now or going to go on trial in Arizona for Charles's murder. But the fact that law enforcement released them and and when Lori left the police station in Chandler, she left with a victim advocate. There was no suspicion. Um, I think that emboldened them to go on and do more things. So that's super unfortunate. But again, it's this sort of manipulative behavior of I'm not getting what I want and I want more. And of course, we know that greed and money was a factor in, in all of Lori's cases. And so I think that plays into it. But before, when when you guys were talking about, you know, families and how they're complicated, Chris, I agree with you. It's it is so complicated. You've got so many personality types and so many different kinds of emotional needs, different love languages and all of those things. And, you know, my theory is is that we're kind of at a point in our history as a nation and as a world where, you know, my my grandparents and great grandparents were. Um, people who survived the world wars and the Great Depression, and they were the silent generation, and none of them got mental health treatment because it just wasn't done. It wasn't available. And then in my parents' generation, you know, the medications weren't good and there was still a stigma. And so there wasn't a discussion about mental health issues, and there wasn't an option for people who were struggling with grief or other things to have an outlet to heal these things. And so necessarily it got passed down to children. And if children don't start to take a look at their harmful behaviors, then they continue to pass it on. And, and it just continues to perpetuate the cycle so that I, I hope that through at least through some of these true crime things, that there will be a broader discussion about mental health and the need for people to heal and for us to really examine our relationships and our connections, are they healthy? Uh, that is an amazing point. I was just kind of reflecting on my own life selfishly there. But um, as and I've talked about this a lot, but as a, the child of a Holocaust survivor, you know, my mom is probably the most inspirational human being that I know her and my father. But um, it comes with let's put it this way. It comes with baggage because uh, she was she was traumatized. She always downplays it. Ah, you're just making up stories, but it does. It comes with, um, you know, my mother's mentality still. Uh, and I do talk about this in the book is, you know, when are the Nazis coming? Uh, she's always it's always in the back of her mind. Um, when is that next shoe going to drop? And uh, I don't want to get to I said we're going to have fun today. But uh, with that said, you know, that trickles down in, in strange ways. Maybe why I'm so. Uh, quirky. I don't know. Um, Grant Lloyd says, by the way, someone just asked how, and this is, these are the real victims here. These three boys, even the pup. I mean, now they have no parents, uh, her horrible, uh, one likely to spend the rest of her life in prison. The other one, no longer with us. Uh, that's the other thing. They don't think about the kids, which is, uh, crazy to me as a father of three children, but, um, I'll stop with my uh, monologue now. Um, Grant Lloyd says, comes down to uh, money, divorce won't make them rich. And that takes us a little further further down the um, detail list here of what happened. So all this stuff about Lisa Darden. And by the way, every time I hear the word Darden for people of a certain age, I think of Chris Darden uh, uh, from the OJ Simpson trial. So I can never get that out of my head. He was one of the prosecutors. So, um, but Lisa Darden is Corey Richen's mother. And uh, 
previously sealed search warrants were just unsealed by the Summit County Sheriff, uh, by the office there. And that's how they found out that since May, so almost for a full year, since May of 2023, uh, when Corey Richens herself was arrested for murder, they have been looking at um, Lisa Darden because of this suspicious death. Um, Chris, I know you're not... <laughs> This is why we were going to have uh, Greg on. And I know you're not a lawyer, but what about the fact, um, you know, you work in concert with the Smart family. I know you know her really well, but um, what about this case? Uh, and I'm talking about the mother now. It dates back almost two decades. I mean, we're talking 16 years. How, how difficult do you think that makes uh, an investigation for police at this point? Uh, it, you know, difficult to say. I think it was interesting, Joel, in, in the beginning, you said uh, truth is is stranger than fiction. And, and that's that's really true in this case. And I'm sure that's complicated things. The fact that they started investigating her almost a year ago uh, tells you that, that, that they're being thorough, that there's quite a bit uh, to the investigation as they look at it. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, this this thing seems to have more and more layers uh, the more we learn about it. Um, by the way, so uh, Greg Scordis, who, again, is Eric Richens, a former family spokesperson, he may still be with them, but in a smaller uh, capacity, he's supposed to join. Uh, but both these guests are phenomenal um, and have tons of experience um, with human matters. You know, um, Megan, obviously dealing with her cousin her and all her uh, things she went through as a child herself. And then you've got uh, Chris, who's a PR guy and he's, you know, he's a storyteller and has heard every story under the sun. So if you have questions, uh, for them, please put the triple Q in there. And yes, I have noticed this. It's a, uh, verbal tick. Hmm. After a guest answers your question, I'll stop doing that, uh, Jerry Michael, but thank you for the uh, lesson. I appreciate it. But if you have questions for them, please triple Q's moving on with the story here. So Lisa Darden, her her uh, partner Trudy Moore, um, they they lived together. They owned together and operated something called Mountain Crest Personal Cleaning. It was essentially a cleaning service. And even though they're a same sex couple in the state of Utah, she's still able to name her a beneficiary. And so Lisa Darden is a beneficiary in the insurance. Uh, on the insurance policy and collected this money. And as investigators are looking at this, they realize that Corey Richens also tried to make herself the beneficiary of an existing life insurance policy. Megan, is this, do you think what we're seeing here without, you know, I, I know we don't want to get into guilt or innocence from Corey's perspective, if in fact this is what happened, and the mother is also responsible, hypothetically. Is this all learned behavior or is this some sort of like distorted gene that they got uh, along the way? Yeah, it's so hard to say without knowing the family really personally and without kind of examining their behavior prior to um, the death of the mom's partner. Because, you know, without having those established patterns and things, we we don't really know. And that's why... In Lori's case, um, you know, that was one of the reasons I decided to start speaking out because I kept hearing people talk about what a doting mother she was and how loving she was and how kind she was. And as you know, that was not my experience with her. I saw signs of manipulation very early in her life. And so without looking at Corey and Corey's mom and, and looking at those early behaviors, it's hard to know if it was learned. But I can imagine in Corey's mind, I'm just trying to think of myself, you know, in that same really strange position. But if I had a parent who had gotten away with the murder of someone and inherited a bunch of money, I might start to see that as an attractive option. Of course, all speculation. Yeah. Uh, Michelle M. here. This is 100 percent a personality disorder. No normal person would do this self-centered to the core. It's one of my mom's favorite expressions. Don't be self-centered. She says that to me only, by the way. And then followed up here, Chris, by we live in a narcissistic society. Have we all become narcissistic? I mean, every time you look around, someone has taken a selfie of themselves, 
posting a video anywhere you look, whether it's Salt Lake, Manhattan, Miami, Florida. I mean, there's even a Instagram handle that is called Influencers in the Wild. Have we kind of run amok because of the advent of technology and social media? Oh, absolutely. And I'm, I'm sure that contributes to uh, what we were talking about earlier with there seeming to be a rise in, in strange and violent crimes. Uh, yeah, we are more narcissistic than ever. I, you know, I'm sure you follow people on social media that you look at and say, really, did you need to tell me that? <laughs> is there, or, you know, is your life normal? I, you know, a, a few years ago, right at daylight savings time, I was feeling a little down and I posted a picture on, uh, on my social media, black and white picture of me saying, Hey, I'm kind of blue. Uh, you know, I, I know I'm not alone. I'm fine. And, and I, it was like I was on suicide watch. I had people calling. I had people calling my colleagues, making sure I was OK. It's such a, a, an unusual thing for people to go on social media and, and be real. It's all about portraying uh, this perfect lifestyle. And I think sometimes when we try to live up to that, uh, there are really dangerous consequences. Uh, yeah, I go ahead. Megan. I yeah, I would agree with you, Chris. I really think that the rise of, of social media has created a disconnection in human beings. You know, we're not getting together in person as much anymore. And we're portraying a segment of our life right on social media, that that part that looks good. And but I, I do think it's really important, too, though, to make a distinction between um, attention seeking behavior and narcissistic behavior. You know, all, all of us appreciate a little appreciation, right? We like to post a picture and get some likes. And I think that the the act of posting and, and seeking likes and stuff like that is one segment of attention seeking. I think narcissism crosses into those harmful behaviors where you start manipulating people, you start abusing people, and you start... Um, it, the thing about narcissism is that they can't form healthy connections and they're not able to empathize with people. And so there's, there are a lot of narcissistic personality traits that can look like aggrandizement, but then there's also covert narcissists and it's super complicated. So I think it's, there's a lot of different things going on that are just, um, you know, driving us apart as a, as a human family and not, not connecting with each other in meaningful ways. By the way, to show you what a good uh, storyteller Chris is, he asked a very simple question, which is the best way to get information of Megan before he we went on air. And then I find out because I'm listening that Megan is a former opera singer. What is <laughs> How long were you an opera singer for? Well, I actually, my undergraduate degree is in music and marketing, and I had piano and voice as my primary instruments. And then um, I just missed singing after I graduated and decided to go to graduate school and get a degree in vocal performance. So after I graduated, I spent about probably four years singing opera professionally before I started my career teaching choir. And I did that for about 15 years. Wow. Did, were you singing uh, those operas in Italian or in English or both? Italian, French, German, Russian, Latin. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Things you find out about people. This is crazy. You need another book. <laughs> Um, I don't know why I'm so blown away by that, but I am, I don't know any opera singers. So there you go. It's unusual. Uh, Lindsay Hendricks here. I understand Eric's family wanting privacy, but the details of the aftermath of Eric's death with the party, the locksmith and Corey assaulting one of the sisters is really something. So this is a story going back in the archives here after his death and they were closing on a house or Corey was celebrating and confronts. Eric's sister and literally they get into like a fist fight Megan I mean that is I mean that like the the hubris and the insanity of that um are there no limits for uh for Corey Richens do you think well if she did in fact poison her husband and you know allegedly of course and you know then goes on to have a party and celebrate I mean that that definitely shows just a remorseless personality and you know it's it's familiar in these types of cases, right? If you don't have the empathy and compassion to realize that what you're doing is going to not only kill the person you were married to, but also have ripple effects and, and hurt and harm every single person who's ever known or loved that person, then, you know, having a party afterwards isn't that far of a stretch. Um, getting in the fight with a grieving sister isn't that much of a stretch. It's just all devoid of compassion and empathy. 
uh, Diane L. S. T. S. and Hidden True Crime should do a show together. Uh, we have talked about it, and uh, we might be doing something special uh, around crime cons. So uh, stay tuned. That's something that the COE uh, is quietly working on behind the scenes. So also, quick reminder: uh, tomorrow, seven p.m. Eastern time, we've got John Singer, Tim Jansen, and John Sawicki, who is in Tallahassee. Uh, former lawyer and a digital forensics expert. And we're going to get you caught up on the Donna Adelson investigation and why in the world Charlie Adelson is now in protective custody uh, in administrative uh, segregation. I spoke to former inmate Tommy Scoville about that, and he gave me his insight. We'll share that with you tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Eastern time. So uh, again, going back to this, trying to figure out this crime 16 years later. None of us on this panel, for full disclosure, are professional investigators. But I imagine, Chris, that they would have to do some sort, assuming she was buried, and I don't know for sure that she was, uh, some sort of exhumation. What do you think so to try to figure out, um, to get to the bottom of what this poisoning was potentially about? Otherwise, I think it would be a non-starter, don't you think? You would think so. I'm sure a very complicated investigation, which is why it has been going on nearly a year uh, in that going back that far. Uh, I'm sure there's ways of determining it, but they can't be easy. So I, I'm sure investigators are, are up against a, a, a very high threshold uh, to, to try to get the evidence that's necessary uh, to push that theory forward. Yeah, it's. Um... It's 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 going to definitely be an uphill battle uh, for investigators, but I'm sure there's a reason they're looking at it. I mean, the big reason, of course, is what happened to Eric Richens, but they must have a sense that they can get to the bottom of it. Otherwise, uh, I don't think they would have began the investigation to begin with, uh, lest you think we are not a international show Canada in the house today. Uh, Lindsay Shea says, love Megan, can't say enough. So. Going back uh, through the story, the bits and pieces of this story, Lisa Darden, Corey's mother, again, her partner is a woman named, was a woman named Trudy Moore. She died in 2006. She was being prescribed at the time oxycodone, a uh, very heavy narcotic. Eric, on the other hand, was not being prescribed fentanyl. Eric, according to Greg Scordis, according to many other people who have been on the show, had no drug issue whatsoever. Although the other side of the family has tried to uh, intimate that he did have a, a drug problem. But as far as we know, there was no drug problem at all. Uh, and this woman, Trudy Moore, she struggled with addiction, with abuse. Um, she, the quote goes, reportedly struggled with abusing her meds. Um, Jeff Dris Jeff O'Driscoll, he is the detective investigating Lisa Darden now. And he said she, however, was not meaning uh, the the partner, this Gertrude Trudy Moore. She, he says, however, was not in a state of recovery from addiction at the time of her death. So based on my training and experience, this would likely rule out the possibility of an accidental overdose. I was confused because I'm slow on the uptake, but I, I know that Megan gets it right away. So she wasn't um, in a state, she wasn't in recovery. In other words, she was still using, do I have that right, Megan? And then therefore she would have been less likely to have overdosed from kind of shocking her system. Do I have that right? Right. And again, looking back at her behavior and the patterns of her life, if, if she had struggled with an addiction and she hadn't sought help or treatment for that addiction. And you're talking about, you know, 14 years ago at the height of the opioid uh, addiction problem in, in a state where it was uh, arguably a huge percentage of the opioid addiction were, were, was centered in Utah at the time. And so, you know, I agree with the detective, you know, based on his training, you, you've got somebody who's got a historical drug use problem it's a prevalent problem in the area that you're investigating and that person hadn't sought treatment. And so I can imagine that they wouldn't have, you know, wanted to look any deeper into that. So going on with this detective's quote, uh, these are the unsealed uh, search warrants and uh, I believe affidavits that were uh, basically made public. The detective writes, and I quote here, 
based on Lisa Darden's, the mother of Corey Richens, proximity to her partner, Trudy Moore's uh, suspicious overdose death and her relationship with Corey, it is possible she was involved in planning and orchestrating Eric's death. So, Chris, this is a really bizarre twist because Sky Lazaro is the defense attorney for Corey Richens. Richens, and we've had her on our show for cases other than this, and she's very smart and very savvy. Do you think now that the defense is going to say, wait, it wasn't Corey Richens. Maybe it was the mom, but it wasn't Corey. Are they going to kind of flip on her now, do you think? Really difficult to say. I also know and respect Sky, uh, very, very bright. Uh, and, and so it, I, the legal strategy, it's always interesting. Uh, because when uh, from the other side, from the defense side, when you're in a case like this, you want to put enough information out that you're able to uh, advocate appropriately for your client. But you don't want to give too much away because you don't want that strategy to come out until you're actually in court. So how she'll play this, it'll be interesting. But we may not know that for some time. Keep in mind, everyone, we are missing our attorney tonight. So uh, we are three of us are giving you our legal expertise uh, that we have from watching lawyers. Uh, this is a quote from Sky Lazaro, who again is on the show frequently and is uh, she's great. She needs a better microphone, but I've told her that otherwise she's great. Uh, Summit County is well aware that opioid addiction and fentanyl overdose is a rampant problem throughout the country. The fact that Miss Darden's significant other was one of the millions that suffered from and ultimately succumbed to opioid addiction is hardly suspicious. It is tragic and unfortunately quite common. The fact that Miss Darden was the beneficiary of her romantic partner's life insurance policy is also not unique. It only demonstrates that her circumstances are no different than most families in uh, America. It's interesting. Every time, Megan, an attorney says something I'm like, oh, yeah, they make perfect sense. I mean, she does make some sense right there. What do you make of that statement by her? No, it's a great argument. And I, I wouldn't want to be up against her in court. You know, it's it, she's spot on with that. Right. And and she's doing her job in, you know, in defending her clients. So I can't fault her for that at all. Look at this. Lindsay Shea says, I love Greg, but Megan and Chris are doing. Of course, they are doing just fine. <laughs> so. Oh, Lisa Darden, she was at, this is where it gets even more interesting. It, it turns out she was at Corey and Eric's house the night that Eric died. Uh, so this cast a lot more suspicion on her. And when law enforcement arrested Corey, they also went and searched uh, Lisa's home and her truck, the mother's home and truck. So Chris, this brings me back to it, that it sounds to me that they know more, obviously, and police always do than we know. Otherwise, I don't think that they would be barking up this tree that she had something to do with the partner. You agree with me or you think I'm nuts? No, I think well, any any investigation, they're looking at all possible angles and all possible leads. Uh, sometimes that's going down rabbit holes. Other times that's chasing something that that is legitimate. Uh, in this case, you know, that there is enough connection there and there's enough suspicion that I'm guessing law enforcement has to take that very seriously and would, would put some real time and resources into investigating that to try to find out it, it, you know, if that contributes or where that contributes. The other thing that gets really difficult, though, too, is you have to have pretty significant evidence to move forward with something. And so it can't just be circumstantial. So they're they're looking for uh, some real concrete things, uh, especially with a case that's 16 years old. Yeah, and these things are uh, dripping out, especially with these unsealed warrants. I'm about to get to some more drips in a minute. But Maria here says the difference is Sky that uh, she's responding to Sky's comments. Sky that a mother and daughter to lose their partner the same way is not common. She is not spot on. Uh, followed by this question from Annie K, who always asks great questions in the chat. Do you think Corey Richens, uh, and I know I'm putting you on the spot here, Megan, and her mom? would have been in cahoots. Uh, so there's two separate issues. I mean, the one main issue is Corey is suspected of murdering her husband and the mom now is suspected of murdering her partner. But then also did Corey's mom and Corey come together, do you think, to commit this crime? What's your gut tell you? 
Yeah, I think it's a good point that it's not common for a mother and daughter to have a partner pass away in the same way. But the attorney's job is to get into the details and make us look at things that we might otherwise pass over due to our own, you know, pre predispositions. Right. So the attorney is saying it was a fentanyl or it was a fentanyl overdose in the case of the daughter. It was an opioid overdose in the case of the mother, which opioid overdoses were very common at that time. So I can I can understand why she's trying to make that distinction. But also, again, spec if we speculate about whether there was involvement um, between the two, between the mother and the daughter, I think it is pretty suspicious that the mom was over the night of uh, of Corey's husband's death. You know, I think it that does cause for it is cause for some kind of concern unless the mother made a habit of going over there all the time. So when we look at true crime, you know, it's really easy to pull out these things that go, oh, that's suspicious. Oh, that's concerning. Oh, that's, but we have to look at the whole picture and the whole story and, and look at people's prior patterns of behavior and their prior ways of interacting with each other to see if it is in fact strange. And I'm glad that's not my job to do that because I don't think I could handle that on a daily basis. And I give a lot of respect to all the law enforcement agents that are involved in investigating these things because it's so easy for us to sit here in our little thumbnails and second guess and armchair quarterback, but we're not the ones who have to follow protocol we're not the ones who have to write reports. We're not the ones who have to make sure that we have an ironclad case that our our evidence follows the property proper chain of custody so that it gets admitted. It's a very complicated and difficult job that they have putting these things together. When Megan was on last time, I called her a modern day Socrates. I have to think of a female philosopher, but here we go. And Helen here says, I just want your response to this, Megan. Money is meaningless your response to that? Well, you know, this is, it's another one of those philosophy things I could talk about for a really, really, really long time. But, you know, if you think about the things that are really the most important things in your life, to me, I think about the relationships with the people that are closest to me, and that's the most valuable thing I have. And if I were to gain, you know, untold wealth and have a really easy life financially, but I didn't have connection with people I cared about, that would be meaningless to me. Um, at, by the same token, I've been on the other side of that coin where, you know, if you're hurting for food and clothing and struggling to make rent, money is really, really important because it's hard to have meaningful connections with the people you love when you're literally scratching and clawing to make a life. So I see both ends of that. I agree with you. One, one more question for uh, Megan. This is Again, right in your wheelhouse. Uh, do people from Jenny Price, do people like this, meaning Corey and her mom, discuss their crimes with family or do they bury it in the back of their psyche themselves? I mean, in the case of your cousin, Lori, I think she was talking about this stuff with more than, you know, just Chad. Uh, was she talking about with her followers? What, what's your hunch on that? Well, we know they had that little group of followers that were basically like a little cult, and I'm sure she was discussing it with them. And we did hear Melanie Gibb was one of the closest people to Lori. And I think Melanie said at one point that she didn't think that it was literal, that she was talking about literal death. We, you know, we can speculate as to whether she's just saying that to, to cover her butt or not. But um, I, I have some opinions about that, which I will keep to myself. But I think, you know, I think it's really... Um, it's so, so difficult as a family member to believe that your family member is capable of something horrific. And so I completely understand, you know, uh, Lori's mom and sister going on Dateline and defending her uh, up and down before the kids were found. I completely understand that. I completely understand Adam's level of, of denial on some, you know, in some ways to say, you know, she told me these things were crazy, but, you know, my mom and I said she wasn't hurting anybody and we just kind of went on because it's so incredibly difficult to break through the psychological barrier of believing that your loved ones are capable of horrific things. And that's why, you know, people say, well, why didn't Corey's husband get out of there? It's the same situation. There are all of these signs of, of her stealing money and maybe possibly poisoning him before, but you know, to, to get to the point where you really think that your life is in danger, it, it takes a lot to break through that. So it's just, it's so difficult. Yeah. There's uh, I think there's a big shock value. We, we've been covering the Riley strain story about the 22 year old that went missing. 
from a Nashville bar and we had his uncle on who hasn't been doing any media and he kind of broke down and just, he said, I can't believe this is happening to our family. Um, different circumstances, but uh, you know, I know Megan and Chris have both seen that and just a uh, general, you know, it's just shock and disbelief that the entire family is going through and I hope they get a uh, resolution uh, to Chris on this one. Uh, people do tend to harp on this, which is why I'm bringing it back up. I still fail to understand why Eric stayed. He told everybody and changed his will. How much more does anyone need to separate your thoughts on why he did in fact stay? I think it was the kids, but what do you think, Chris? Oh, absolutely. I think Megan uh, covered this well. I, th this is one of those situations where it, it's complex. It, it's easy to play armchair quarterback and true crime in general. That's part of the reason we enjoy it. Uh, at the same time, being in that situation is very different when you are being manipulated, when the stakes, it's not necessarily money in his case, but his children uh, and, and his family. Uh, it, people will go to extremes staying in, a, in situations where there are all the indications, all the red flags uh, because of a number of things. But psychologically, there's usually something that's tying them there. Uh, slack jaw. I, and again, I'm almost sure it was the kids. I would, you know, I would not want to leave my own children. Is there a healthy degree, Megan, of narcissism in your opinion? Well, again, I, I just want to distinguish between narcissism and, and other things, right? Self-love is not narcissism. Um, Attention-seeking behavior is not narcissism. There are very specific de definitions that meet the criteria for a personality disorder called narcissistic personality disorder. So if you have somebody in your life who's selfish, if you have somebody in your life who you think is always putting themselves in front of other people, if you have somebody in your life who's constantly taking and posting selfies and counting how many likes they get, that's not narcissism. There, there are very specific traits that have to do with narcissism that include some of those things, sure, but it takes it to, to another level. Tanya, she's a philosopher, modern day. Uh, Juniper by uh, Ralink. Uh, this is an interesting and sad comment. My dad used to threaten that he would unalive my mom and us kids. He also talked frequently about unaliving himself for years and did. This just brought me back to the kind of the, more humor story that Chris was saying about posting about him being blue one day, which we all are. But Chris, you're in the communications business. How seriously do we have to take, you know, within our own families, these sorts of threats, whether they're veiled or not, when someone in the family is saying this, and you can see here that sadly it became a reality. You know, very, very tragic. And, and my heart always breaks. I've worked around a number of murders and suicides and, and, uh, the people that are left behind, regardless of the circumstances, are are victims, and and it's it, it changes their lives. Uh, anytime there's a warning sign, uh, really, you should take action. Uh, an interesting piece of advice I heard a, a while back, and I've, I've started to practice this with my kids as it relates to self harm, is asking if they've ever had ideation, suicidal ideation. That's pretty common. That's not if you're having suicidal ideation, you're actually pretty normal. Everybody at some point has a downtime and, and they think about those things. But telling the kids, do you think about it? Because that's normal. But if you ever get to the point where it's more than thinking about it, come talk to me, let me know. Having that open that open line of communication, you know, same thing as, as it relates, a lot of people are surprised uh, as it relates to death by suicide that uh, the, the highest demographic isn't teenagers though. It is middle-aged men because uh, men don't communicate. They don't share their feelings. They often feel trapped. They have uh, often, Few out, few places to to get self care, or or to, and they don't take care of themselves, and so they find themselves in this position. So, anytime, and I'm very sensitive to this, having worked around, uh, you know, a number of, of deaths by suicide. Anytime there's any sign of it, you know, take immediate action, uh, help that person, put your arm around them. Uh, and I know in cases where it's abusive, like like she was talking about, that may be a little bit different, but, but getting help either for yourself or, or for that individual is absolutely paramount. I didn't know that, that men, uh, middle-aged men were the highest, uh, risk, the biggest number, by the way, black widow, or, um, you're not sick at all. You're a hundred percent spot on and, uh, appreciate that comment. So not sick at all. And thank you for, uh, reaching out. I'm getting back to you. Don't you worry. I'm getting back to you. Black widow, uh, from the Republic of Ireland, 
next to my mother and my wife. She scares me uh, third in line. I don't know why, but Black Widow, I got to stay in line with her. Um, that I just totally lost my train of thought. I keep having these like uh, short little like Alzheimer's moments. But let's get back to what I love about this show tonight is that we're talking about a story, but we're talking about so many other things. Uh, I think that are really important. So uh, kudos to Megan and Chris for being here and uh, kind of rolling the, with the punches without uh, Greg Scordis, who is actually kind of the nuts and bolts guy who knows a lot of the details of the case. But one of the details that was just leaked out is from investigators. They obtained a search warrant for doorbell camera footage of the night that uh, Eric died. And again, keep in mind, Corey's mother was there that night. But what they discovered, and this is a direct quote out of one of the search warrants, there have been reports of other people coming to the home the night of the death that were not reported by Corey or her mother. Chris, what, if anything, does that tell you? Could these potentially be, I mean, no one's been arrested, so I, I don't want to say co-conspirators or, you know, Corey wasn't upfront about it. She wasn't transparent about it but there were other people. How do you read into it? Well, I, I think first off, it's speculation at this point. Uh, and, and maybe siding just a little bit with Corey, having been around some serious trauma, your memory is, is, is impaired. Uh, it, you know, it, it's overwhelming, regardless of what your role may or, or may not have been in this. The things that you see and remember, the way in which you remember things, uh, can be can be very different. So it's difficult to say, you know, maybe they did have something to do with it. Maybe they didn't. The fact that she didn't report those, I don't think is, is, is terrifically unusual in that details are often lost when there is significant trauma. Um, rightfully so here. Lisa Darden, she has remained quiet. She really hasn't uh, said a word about this, although she was in front of the media for a time. But since these allegations have come out, uh, she has remained silent. And it is important to note that no charges uh, have been filed in connection with either related to Lisa Darden, either in relation to Eric Richens' death or to Trudy Moore's, uh, what, what has been... Um, cited as an accidental overdose, but I can tell you that investigators are working on it. And we're going to have to kind of hang on to uh, the edge of our seats to see how this transpires. And again, Greg Scordis is on the uh, curve of that and uh, he'll be in touch with me. And um, obviously I'll be in touch with him to, to follow how all that plays out. One of the things that happened prior to all this, uh, Megan, and this was uh, several months back, Prosecutors also are alleging that Corey was witness tampering. This was a whole big deal that she went ahead and asked her brother, whose name is Ronnie Darden, to testify to inform falsely. That is a quote to testify to inform falsely. That kind of behavior, again, it, it just there's a certain level of arrogance to it. Is that how you see it or do you see it as, you know, desperation? She's just trying to get herself out of this situation now. Yeah, I think arrogance plays into it. I think also, again, it's a manipulative tactic. It's one of those immature things of, you know, I'm not going to get what I want the, the legal way or the prop through the proper channels. So I'm going to manipulate someone else to say something for me. And that's a pattern, you know, among criminal behavior, of course. And, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense in in the con in this context that, you know, Corey would try to co-opt people onto her side and try to get people to, you know, make her look better than she is or try to, you know, um, tell a different narrative that's going to absolve her of some responsibility. In addition to, uh, you know, this this allegation by the state about uh, trying to witness tamper with the brother. Um, and of course, Lisa Darden's son, there was a six page letter to Lisa Darden, to the mother from Corey Richens. And it now is so convoluted because she, of course, is now being investigated herself. But this six page letter uh, notes uh, or, or implies that the defense attorney here, Sky Lazaro, who both Chris and I know, and I'm not sure if Megan knows her. Uh, she's very bright that she in this letter, uh, Corey says, wants to link. Eric getting drugs and pills from Mexico. 
uh, that Corey's brother, again, would need to testify to a memory that is super short with not a lot to it. Now, it is the job of a lawyer, a criminal defense attorney, Chris, as you know, is to create enough reasonable doubt. And it wouldn't surprise me if that was a possible defense that Eric was trying to get, you know, drugs and pills from Mexico. But again, according to everything we have seen, there's zero indication of that. Uh, but what do you make of the fact that she's now writing this to her mom, knowing full well she's in a jail cell? They're going to do she, by the way, she had a seizure and that's how they ended up in her jail cell searching it and they found it. So, I mean, what does that tell you about her uh, that she had the audacity uh, to, to just to do this in the first place? Well, it's very suspicious. Uh, it, it, it's hard to reconcile. And, and having not seen all the evidence, I, I don't understand. But from what we have seen, it's suspicious. And, and it really makes you question her judgment and, and, and question you know, her motives in that. that that's just it's something that a reasonable, rational person uh, wouldn't do. And, and, and it, you know, the optics of it are terrible. It's not that she did it for optical reasons, but it sure leads many to believe uh, that, you know, that she's implicated in, in, in his murder. And uh, Miss Brazy here, and that's a good point, says uh, probably fake the seizure. I have no idea, but I do know that she was given uh, medical care. Analytical Blarney AB, friend of the show. Not a good look, Corey. Not a good look. So uh, there's more to this letter. Megan, Corey, and again, this is where I'm, I'm fascinated. Be, uh, you, you would never, if you're writing this book, if I was writing you know, fiction, I would not think to write this, but she urges her brother, this guy, Ronnie Darden to tell Sky Lazar, the defense attorney that a year, this is so detailed that a year before Eric's death, while watching a Sunday football game together, Eric confided in his pain pill and fentanyl habit to Ronnie Darden. According to the letter allegedly written by Corey, Eric said he got the drugs from the family's ranch hands and that Eric had instructed him, quote unquote, not to tell Ronnie because I would get mad because I always said he just, and I mean, I'm sorry, not to tell Corey because I would get mad because I always said he just gets high every night and won't help take care of the kids. What, what, again, what's so interesting to me about this, Megan, is the level of detail, Sunday night football, uh, you know, about uh, how his, his brother, was dealing with the cartel and the ranch hands. What is that? What is that all about? Because again, every single indicator is that he had zero drug problem, no issues, clean as a whistle, all of these things. And then we hear and read this letter. Yeah. Again, I just, every time I, I hear another behavior of hers, that manipulation word comes into, into my mind every time, you know, she had to have known that all of her communications going out of the prison were going to be monitored and read. And maybe she secretly hoped that her giving a super detailed explanation of something that happened that, you know, maybe cast some doubt on her actions um, she maybe she secretly hoped that law enforcement would see that and then look into it and you know that that's going to sort of absolve her on some level so I just think it's I it, it I think it was planned you know I think she planned for that letter to be found wildfire says the letter is diabolical that's interesting that she in fact planned on it that's really interesting I wouldn't have thought of that but uh Megan is savvier than I am uh, all she has right now is time to think of this uh BS uh Corey was trying to be a slickster uh, was there domestic violence? I mean, there was an attempt by her, uh, according to all reports, that Corey did try to poison him, I think once, if not twice beforehand. And somehow, you know, he got really ill. He vomited. That would have definitely been, um, you know, a red flag for me. And I would have tried to get my behind out of there. But there's so many things that keep us tethered to a home, including our kids. And he never did that. Uh, one of the other interesting things, and we'll start to wind it down in a moment. She purchases not one, not two, not three, but four life insurance plans, uh, Chris, four different life insurance plans totaling on his policies on his life, totaling $2 million. Um, this happened a couple of years before the crime. Do you think she was planning this all well in advance? Difficult to say, but the optics on that sure aren't good. I mean, that if I found out my spouse was taking out 
life insurance policies on me without me knowing. Of course, he didn't know that, but that's a very suspicious activity that that shows uh, some narcissism and, and, and some real lack of trust. I, I mean, I, I, it's really hard to reconcile why somebody would do something like that. I, I, I cannot wrap my head around it. Getting back to kind of the origin story of this, and then I promise we'll wrap in just a couple of moments. Corey Richens' housekeeper, who was a, an Eric's housekeeper, a convicted drug dealer, she eventually confessed to selling the fentanyl to Corey. It was two batches of fentanyl, and this was in the weeks before she uh, had allegedly used some uh, to poison uh, Eric, of course. The woman's name is Carmen Marie Lauber, and she's 51 years old. She was first linked over a series of text messages to Corey. Uh, this was all around the time uh, that the book was coming out. Lauber, for whatever reason, was not arrested or not charged. And I don't know if that's, I wish we could ask Greg that, if she's going to be some sort of state's witness. Chris, do you happen to know that? No idea. No idea. I, I do know that there were some concerns and, and the defense was really playing it up strong that because of her past criminal activity, because of the fact that she was dealing drugs, that she lacked credibility and that she had motivation, especially the, the police when they first interviewed her made it very clear that what they had on her could result in four felonies. And, and so the defense is, is making the uh, assertion that, you know, she wasn't completely truthful. She had things to lose in this. So it'll be interesting to see uh, as a witness uh, how she is used and, and whether or not uh, the defense can play up that, that credibility uh, issue enough to, to discredit her. Uh, this question we answered, but it goes on here. Uh, per the affidavit with this information, this housekeeper, and this is a direct quote, admitted to supplying Corey Richens with 15 to 30 fentanyl pills on two separate occasions, approximately one month before Eric's death. She stated Corey paid her approximately $900 each time she supplied the pills. She provided details of the solicitation of the drugs, the pickup and drop off locations and other pertinent details that have been corroborated with digital forensic evidence. Uh, Chris, just back to you on this. This sounds, you know, like they've got a lot of, as they say, forensic evidence buttoned up here. And if she does turn state's witness, this is a pretty solid case, I think, for the state moving ahead, don't you? Absolutely important piece of evidence. If they can prove that, uh, it's going to have a significant impact, I would think, on the jury and, and, and on the ultimate uh, verdict in this case. And then Lauber, this uh, housekeeper, she actually has a prior conviction uh, back in 2021 for drug possession with intent to distribute. So it is not her first rodeo, as they say. Uh, Megan, the thing that kind of sticks out to me in this story also is the, st the story goes that Corey eyed Eric. She was she was working at a Home Depot. He comes from a very wealthy family, and that's how they connected. Is there anything that you would offer up about the fact that she kind of comes from very little means and here's this, you know, big wealthy family that she marries into. And then she's now manipulating the person of lower means here, this housekeeper to get her the drugs ultimately to allegedly kill her husband. Kind of a weird dynamic. Uh, what do you make of that? If anything? Yeah. It makes me go back to thinking about what Dr. John said about people who poison that they are, generally speaking, deeply insecure and feel they have feelings of inadequacy. And I can imagine that the disparity between Corey's upbringing and, and her husband's, you know, certainly probably added to that. And perhaps she saw the housekeeper more as an equal and felt more comfortable, um, you know, asking for her help. But at the same time, she's paying the housekeeper's bill, you know, she's, she's paying the housekeeper to be there. So then maybe she feels like she has a little bit of an upper hand to manipulate her as well, to not say anything, to keep things quiet. So it's complicated. It'll be interesting to see what evidence plays out to support these kinds of uh, relationships. Uh, to me, a fascinating show. I just saw a comment that irked me and I'm going to read it out loud uh, to make a point here. About 30 minutes in all over the place. The reason I love this show is we're all over the place. I, I definitely have ADHD. I've never formally been diagnosed, but got two amazing guests on. And so 
why not go off the beaten path? We were weaving in the story the whole time. I think we got the whole story in there. That is the uh, the purpose and the point. Chris Thomas, his purpose and point, uh, besides being a family man, is uh, PR. He helps people tell stories. He's been doing it for more than 25 years, and he's also the author of a book uh, about Elizabeth Smart and his uh, dealings with her called Unexpected. Chris, your uh, final thoughts tonight it can be about life. It can be about the story, anything you want. I, I always feel for the people involved on, on both sides. I think it's really interesting, though. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the circumstances surrounding it, uh, you know, are, are, are stranger, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. And as a result, there's a lot of interest. It's also, you've got two great communicators in Sky Lazaro on the defense. Uh, and then I, you sound, it sounded like he may be playing a lesser role, but with Greg Scordis, uh, and I, I think the Richens family was very savvy in bringing Scordis in, somebody who understands legal, that could take some of the pressure off of them. Uh, because in a case like this, you're getting bombarded by media. Literally, everybody's calling you constantly, wanting somebody on. Uh, but somebody that can tell that story, take the pressure off. And then secondly, important to, to mention as well, there's a number of civil cases uh, surrounding surrounding this issue and the custody of the children being part of that. Uh, and with Scordis speaking on behalf of the family, they're not saying anything that could be used against them in these civil cases. And it's, I think it's really smart uh, how they're how they're handling it. On the flip side, I think Sky's been very responsive to the media in, in communicating as well. So we have an interesting case with two great communicators who, who are helping to, to tell that story. And it's only going to get uh, more attention and more interesting as time goes on. Yeah, Chris, one question I should have definitely asked. I mean, how big a story is this in uh, Utah and Salt Lake City? Uh, pretty significant. I, I, you know, anytime there's a development, it it's uh, talked about. I mean, he used to say, there's so few of us that watch the six and 10 o'clock news anymore. So I don't know what the order is on six or 10 o'clock, but I see it all over social media. People are talking about it uh, constantly. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a strange story. Uh, Utah is not immune to having strange stories, but this is, this one's particularly uh, interesting, uh, a beautiful family. Uh, circumstances that are highly unusual. Uh, and, 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 you know, we're all kind of watching to see how it turns out, but there's a lot of interest right now. And you heard Chris, traditional media is dying. That's why you better get in with STS. Start watching STS. Ned Smith with the most important question of the day. Chris Thomas, she wants to know all about your desk behind you. What <laughs> year? What's the story with the desk? Uh, it's an S swivel roll top desk from 1929. It was a college graduation present for my parents, which uh, I wanted an old used car. They got me the desk uh, back then. I was a little disappointed, but now I absolutely love it. I'm grateful that car would be in a junkyard somewhere. So uh, a treasure. If I knew maybe next time I come on, I'll, I'll uh, unroll it. And but it, it's pretty, pretty dirty right now. That's the great part is I can hide uh, a lot of my junk uh, and, and, and look like I'm all tidy. 1929. Do you have to roll it up slowly and roll it down slowly? A little bit. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, it can come crashing down on your fingers. It's, it's a pretty interesting piece. I, I, I love antiques and, and it's really, uh, it's a gem. That's awesome. Uh, by the way, even desks have stories. Uh, today was Frederick Morris Roosevelt Brown's first ever visit to a dog park went with Ethel and uh, we survived barely. Uh, I brought him to the big side. There's a small side and a big side. And I brought him to the big side of the park. Um, he was holding his own. He was being a tough guy. And then a little dog took issue with him and he sounded like a gremlin uh, being mutilated. It was the craziest <laughs> sound I've ever heard. Ethel, I couldn't believe it, ran over to defend him and I had to rip him apart Fred has all his shots, Ned Smith. Fred has all his shots. I wouldn't put him in harm's way. I did this with Mabel Rose, my beloved puggle of seven, almost 17 years. I brought her to the dog park when she was three. He's older. He's closer to four months now, but Mabel was three months. I know you. this is the best part of the show, right? And uh, long story short, Mabel was the coolest, calmest dog. And I'm trying to do that with Frederick Morris, Roosevelt Brown. The M and the R, of course, are for... Mabel Rose. Uh, shout out to Greg Scordis, who obviously is in court. Uh, we'll get him back on another time to talk about this. 
Megan Connor, what can we say about her other than she is the modern day Socrates, an opera singer, a choir teacher, the mother of six spectacular human beings. She uh, broke a generational uh, cycle of trauma. I might need her help with that as I uh, work my way through the stuff I deal with with my mom. Uh, I walked through the I, I walked through fire to get here is the name of her book, as well as 100 ways to practice self care. Look at this, you rock, Megan. Uh, Diane says we have a roll top desk. Also, uh, Space Coast letting us know he does all the audio, all the technolo technological stuff on the West Coast. Um, Letting us know he doesn't really cook. There you go. And Equinox, look at this. I wish Mabel lived to 19. She'd still be with me right now. How about that? Megan, your final thoughts. It can be on dogs, Corey Richens, <laughs> love, uh, whatever you want. Your your final thoughts tonight. Well, first of all, I'm going to say, Chris, I am a super fan of your desk as well. My dad had one just like it and just like yours. Um, you did not want to open it because it was always messy on the inside. But we always used to say that, you know, that was a sign of a creative person. So I love it. Um, you. you know, I, I'm always going to take whatever opportunity that I can to say that, you know, healing is so important for all of us. And I think all of us have unmet emotional needs on some level. And that necessitates working through things, either with a coach or a therapist, especially um, if it's trauma, we need somebody who specializes in trauma. And we really can't have healthy connections with other people until we learn to love and accept all the parts of ourselves first. And so that's, that's the most important work to do if we really want to have meaningful relationships in our lives. Very, very well said. I won't even begin to try to pronounce this name, but final thoughts from that person is STS Nation Rocks. I love that. That's why we'll leave it up. Love you, America. Love you, Utah. Love you, Texas. And of course, uh, let's keep uh, Eric Richens and his family in our thoughts. We'll be back tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Eastern time. By the way, I scored free tickets to the Miami Open tomorrow. So I'm going to be there during the day and we'll be exhausted tomorrow night. I'm warning everyone in advance, but we're catching up on the Donna Adelson investigation and what's going on with Charlie Adelson with an amazing panel. And then, of course, Scott Phil Friday at noon. Until then, have a great night. Guests, stick around for one second.